For serious backcountry trips, your food is by far the most important thing that you'll carry. You could have the best gear, you could be in top notch physical condition, and you could have the highest skill set. But if you lack the skills to effectively provision, it'd be like running diesel to a Ferrari. A lot of the time it could go unrealized, but your nutrition directly impacts your physical performance, your mood, your mental sharpness, your decision making, your energy levels, all of that. When I first started backpacking, I focused on just one metric calories per ounce. I wanted my food to be as light as possible, but as you could imagine, that backfired on me big time. I found myself utterly exhausted during my trips. I was a whole lot tougher back then than I am now, so I just kind of powered through it, but looking back on it, it was totally unnecessary. You see, back then, I didn't fully understand what it really meant to put together a load of lightweight provisions. When we're putting together our ultralight food, the goal is not to put together the lightest food possible. Actually, once you get to the point with provisioning where you're able to fully understand and internalize what not to bring, the weight of your provisions becomes almost irrelevant. The actual goal with ultralight provisioning is to refine your food to fulfill your nutritional needs as effectively and efficiently as possible. Let's take a step back for a minute and talk about macronutrients, our energy sources. There are three types of macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Carbohydrates and protein both weigh roughly 100 calories per ounce, and fat weighs about 240 calories per ounce. This means that by weight, fat is about 140% more calorically dense than carbs and protein. Also, that caloric density by weight almost always translates pretty directly to caloric density by volume. This is one of the main reasons why fat is king in the context of provisioning, but unfortunately, we can't only eat fat. Protein is actually, in a sense, the most important nutrient. In the most technical sense, you actually don't need carbs, and you could probably go quite a while without fat, but with protein, it's a different story. Your body relies on a consistent protein intake for its growth, repair, and maintenance, and it's especially important to keep your muscles healthy. We want to make sure that we're keeping up with our body's protein needs, but we don't want to eat too much of it. It's difficult for our bodies to digest protein, and because of that, protein is not an efficient source of energy. Luckily with protein, consuming an excessive amount does not do you any good, and it can actually be bad for you. So there is a sweet spot that we could shoot for. An ideal protein intake isn't a specific number or percentage. It's more of a range that varies based on your specific needs. In general though, if you're not sure how much protein you need, a good number to aim for is that protein make up at least 15% of your calories. The two main sources of energy that our bodies use are carbohydrates and fat. Like I said before, carbohydrates are much heavier than fat is, and they take up a lot more space. Carbohydrates are an extremely effective energy source for high intensity activities over relatively short periods of time. I'm not gonna bore you with all the technicalities because that would take all day, but for endurance activities like hiking where you're expending a whole lot of energy at relatively low intensity over relatively long periods of time, carbohydrates are not the most effective source of energy. On the other hand, when fat is used properly as a fuel source, it can be digested extremely efficiently and it'll provide you with sustained energy over long periods of time. Here's the catch though, most people have trained their bodies to run on carbs and are unable to efficiently digest large amounts of fat. Most people require a large amount of carbs to function properly. The ability to digest large amounts of fat is not inherent. It's something that you need to train your body to do over a long period of time. If you're eating too much fat and not enough carbs, it will lead to a whole host of issues, both physical and mental fatigue, a reduced mood, brain fog. You don't wanna do that. Those effects will be especially noticeable from like the second or third day to like the seventh or eighth day of a big increase of fat in your diet. So what is the magic proportion? How much fat can your body handle? What is the minimum amount of carbs that your body needs? Well, I got bad news for you. There is no magic proportion. The macronutrient proportion that's going to be most effective for your physical and mental performance is going to be your current one. If you currently follow a strict no carb diet or you're an Eskimo from 200 years ago, then that's great. You'll be able to effectively consume a proportion of macronutrients that is as lightweight as possible because you'll be able to digest large amounts of fat. For everybody else, it's a different story. The average person will probably benefit most by starting off their trips with a proportion of calories from fat that's about five to 10% higher than usual. If you then slowly increase your proportion of fat each day, then after about two weeks, you should be able to increase your proportion of calories from fat by about 15 to 20%. After a month long trip, you should be able to increase your proportion of calories from fat by about 25 to 30%. 
To some people, these numbers might seem a little bit conservative, but it's way better to be on the conservative side than it is to consume a proportion of macros that's gonna hinder your performance. Bringing a proportion of macronutrients that is too lightweight will provide diminishing returns. A lighter pack will provide no benefit to you if you do not have the energy to carry it. Now that you've figured out the proportions of your energy sources, you need to figure out the amount of energy that you need. In other words, how many calories do you need per day? Despite what anybody says, there are so many different factors that determine your calorie requirements that it's impossible to figure this out with a simple calculation. For me personally, I can burn up to about 7,000 calories per day, uh, but for a full day of intense hiking, I average about 5,000 calories per day. Because of the huge variability, your calorie needs are something that you'll need to figure out through your own experimentation. For shorter trips, it's not always efficient, realistic, or possible to consume a high calorie diet, but for longer trips, the rule of thumb is when in doubt, eat more. It is very easy to under eat on hike, and a lot of the time this could go unrealized. The impact that a caloric deficit has on you is something that is so easy to overlook, but it really does have a big impact on your performance. Picture two people, Sophie and Emma. Sophie's body burns 2,000 calories per day, but over the course of two weeks, she only consumes 1,000 calories per day. Emma is an endurance athlete, so she pigs out and she eats 4,000 calories per day, but what she doesn't realize is her body is burning 5,000 calories per day. Now, what is gonna happen to each of these girls? Well, we already know the answer for Sophie, right? She'll experience both physical and mental fatigue. Her cognitive ability will be reduced. She'll get real moody. Her immune system will weaken. Her body won't be able to repair itself as quickly. She'll lose a lot of muscle and fat. It won't be good. Okay, now what will happen with Emma? Although Emma will have a significant psychological advantage and she could possibly have a physical advantage in the short term, over the course of the long term, the deficit will catch up to her. And by the end of those two weeks, assuming that Emma has the same kind of build that Sophie does, she'll probably be experiencing the same exact effects as Sophie. The difference between the two is Sophie understands what's happening and so she could correct her diet, but Emma has no clue. So those effects will just become her new normal. This is why when we're engaged in endurance activities for long periods of time, it is so important to fully understand our caloric requirements. It is so easy for a hiker to be at a significant caloric deficit and not even realize it. Just because the effects of a deficit can be mistaken for a million other things. On the other hand though, once you're able to accurately estimate your caloric needs, you'll be able to use that information to your advantage. If you want to on your big backcountry trips, you'll be able to put your body through a slight caloric deficit in order to save weight. In other words, you'll be able to effectively carry a portion of your calories on your belly instead of on your back. All right, now we know how to fuel ourselves, but we need more than just macros to stay healthy and perform at our best. We need micronutrients. The micronutrient that is most important for us to manage is sodium. Sodium is especially important in hot environments. Sodium does a lot for us, but most importantly, we need it to retain water and stay hydrated. A sodium deficiency can cause a whole bunch of problems, but it'll probably first manifest as symptoms of dehydration. Next, we have fiber, which I don't even know if this is technically a micronutrient. Fiber is actually a carbohydrate that that our bodies can't digest. Fiber is useful because it slows down the time it takes our bodies to digest carbohydrates uh, so it could control our blood sugar levels. And it also helps in our process of digestion. You should definitely do your own research on fiber. The specific amount of fiber that your body needs is very much debatable. The thing to know with fiber though is it's very common in a whole lot of foods, but it's essentially dead weight so it should be minimized as much as possible. Also keep in mind that if you're trying to be on a very high calorie diet, then consuming a lot of fiber may make it hard for you to take in enough calories. Personally, I take very little fiber on my trips, but that's just me and I feel like I'm not in a position to say whether that's been working out or not, because I really don't know. Next, I am going to lump together all of the other micronutrients, all of the vitamins and minerals. On a trip that's less than a week long, all of these little micronutrients don't really matter that much, but on a really long trip, they really do matter. I actually do not believe that it's important to manage all these individually. I feel like even if you try to manage each and every one of these individually, you would inevitably slip up with something. This probably goes without saying, but the best way to make sure that you're getting all your micronutrients is to just diversify your diet as much as you can. Picking up some fresh fruit, vegetables, and meat once in a while goes a really long way. Also, if you have cravings for a certain type of food, Definitely listen to your cravings because they're there for a reason. The sun's going down right now, so I gotta get off of this mountain. Uh, unfortunately, I think I gotta wrap this up inside. All right, where were we? How to eat. 
Now, let's talk about the way in which you eat your food because how you eat can be very important. For me, I don't have a consistent eating routine or anything like that, and I switch up how I eat a lot, but I definitely notice that I'm affected a lot by how I eat. If you're the type of person that's groggy in the mornings, you'd probably benefit from eating a lot of carbs for breakfast. If you're like me and your energy is highest in the mornings, you'd probably benefit from eating a lot of fat for breakfast. If you find that you hit the wall sometime in the afternoon, then you might benefit from a shot of carbs then. Eating a ton of fat before bed will probably help you sleep better, it'll keep you warmer, and it'll help you make up for missing calories. Eating protein before bed will help your body repair itself overnight. Consuming your calories, especially your carbs, consistently throughout the day instead of in two or three big meals can help to keep your energy levels more consistent. And last tip, it is a lot quicker and easier to drink your calories than it is to eat them. Before we figure out what types of food we're going to bring, we need to figure out how we're going to be preparing our food. There are three ways that you could prepare your food. You could cook it, you could cold soak it, or you could just eat it dry. If you're going to be cooking your food, you basically have four good options. You could use a white gas stove, like something similar to the MSR Whisper Light. These are kind of heavy, but they are very reliable, and if they do happen to break, they are repairable. They're probably going to be the best option if you're going to be running a whole lot of fuel through your stove. If you're in an extremely cold environment and you're relying on your stove to melt your water, then something like this might be the only good option. The most popular stove with backpackers is a canister stove. These are extremely user-friendly and they get the job done, but they really don't have any significant advantages aside from the ease of use. The simplest and lightest stove is an alcohol stove. In the context of backpacking, an alcohol stove is a non-pressurized stove that just burns straight alcohol. You can build an alcohol stove in just a couple minutes with materials that you can get from a gas station for a couple bucks. Alcohol stoves are cool because they're extremely simple and they don't have any mechanical parts that can break, but they are more dangerous, they don't burn that hot, and they can be kind of difficult to use. The fourth option is to just cook your food over a wood fire, which is, in my opinion, the most fun. But I think it goes without saying that cooking your food in general is just extremely inefficient compared to just not cooking your food. On my hiking trips, I never cook. I don't want to carry fuel, a stove, a pot, and most importantly, I don't want to spend the time and energy that it takes to cook food. The most efficient way to prepare your food is to either cold soak it or just not prepare it at all and have food that you could eat dry. For most of my trips, I like to bring a large peanut butter jar for cold soaking, but for shorter trips, I like to simplify things even more and just cold soak out of Ziploc freezer bags. For pretty much all of my trips, I'd say at least 90% of the food that I bring is food that I could either drink or food that I could eat dry. By bringing these kinds of foods, I save a crazy amount of time, I save a crazy amount of energy, and it makes it very easy for me to eat consistently throughout the day and make sure I'm taking in enough calories. On a deep wilderness trip, there are so many things that you need to be doing, so many things that you need to be worrying about, so many things that you need to be thinking about. You don't need to let food preparation take up your valuable energy and take up any of your valuable real estate in your head. Finally, we can now get into what to eat what food to bring. I am a huge proponent of keeping food as simple as possible. A lot of people like to bring fancy, complicated food. They'll bring food that's specifically designed for hiking or specifically designed for sports or whatever, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what you need to understand is there is absolutely nothing special about that food. Most of the ingredients that you'll find in specialty hiking food are ingredients that you can find in any supermarket. The ingredients in those things that are a bit more difficult to source are ingredients that can easily be substituted without sacrificing nutritional value or flavor. When you buy specialty food like that, what you're doing is paying a high premium to have somebody else determine your nutrition. For most people, this works out completely fine. If you wanna optimize your food though, this probably is not the way to do that. The easiest way to develop the skill of being able to optimize your food is to become intimately familiar with the nutritional value of the foods and ingredients that are readily available wherever you go. Personally, I could walk down, say, the baking aisle of any grocery store and without reading any labels, be able to know the macros, micros, calories per ounce, all of that of most of the items there. That little skill allows me to provision extremely quickly and efficiently in any place with any budget and in any period of time. So. What are my favorite simple foods and ingredients? Powdered whole milk is by far my favorite of the favorites. On a hike, it is so good, and both its macros and micros are spot on. With some creativity, you could incorporate powdered milk into most of your meals if you wanted to. Peanut butter. Who doesn't love peanut butter? Peanut butter is super calorie dense, 
and its proportion of macros makes it super easy to incorporate a whole lot of it into your diet. It's also a surprisingly versatile ingredient if you get creative with it. Oil. Olive oil, vegetable oil, whatever can be added to most meals to boost their caloric density. And when I say most, I really do mean most. Granola, especially a real fatty granola or granola that you've added oil to, has a decent balance of macros. It's super versatile. And for what it is, it's very calorically dense and volumetrically dense. Pepperoni is both very calorie dense from fat and very high in protein. I personally get meat cravings if I don't take any of it on my trips, so I always make sure that I take at least a little bit of animal protein on my trips. Summer sausage is less calorie dense compared to protein, but it is more protein dense. Chocolate, especially a dark chocolate with a lot of fat and not a lot of sugar, is an amazing snack, obviously, and it has a surprising balance of macros and a surprising amount of nutritional value. Ramen noodles are cheap, accessible, easy, and they can be eaten dry if needed. They're also a really great way to incorporate salt into your diet. Nuts like peanuts, sunflower seeds, and almonds are super calorie dense and they have a pretty decent balance of macros. They are another good way to get salt into your diet. Cheez-Its, Cheetos, and Fritos are some of the chips with the highest calorie density and they are also very volumetrically dense. They're also some of my favorites. Peanut M&Ms are super calorie dense for a candy. French onions, the crispy topping kind of thing, are really good and really calorie dense. Cocoa powder is the thing that has by far the least amount of nutritional value on this list, but it is definitely a huge staple in my diet. I'll add it to milk and shakes and stuff like that. Sugar and flour is cheap, accessible, and can be added to most of your meals to boost carbs, boost flavor, and save you money. On a long hike, I'll switch it up of course and add as much diversity to my diet as I can, but those are just my go-tos. With those ingredients and ones that are similar to them, I can create meals that take off all of the boxes. I can make meals that are lightweight, low volume, cheap, accessible, easy to prepare and eat, have optimized macronutrients, and most importantly, are gonna be enjoyable for me. A lot of people will consider either most or all of the food that I just listed to be junk food, uh, but I don't look at all of it that way. Most people would define junk food as high calorie, heavily processed food. On a hike though, eating high calorie, heavily processed foods is unavoidable. Eating large amounts of healthy food on a hike, like fruits and vegetables, is not only extremely impractical, but it's also extremely unhealthy. Because on an intense hike, if you're eating those kinds of foods that are really low calorie, high fiber, then it's gonna be either impossible or near impossible to take in enough calories on that kind of a diet. I guess the way that I look at things is I eat a lot of junk food, but I really try to minimize the amount of junk that I eat in my food. Junk being anything artificial. Preservatives, fillers, flavoring, sweeteners, anything that doesn't belong. Most artificial additives are not gonna give you any problems, but obviously some of them will if you eat them in large quantities. And with any of them, they're all just dead weight, so there's no good reason to bring them along with you on a hike. All right, now that we've picked out our food, we need to talk about packaging. Repackaging all your food into Ziploc bags is a super, super easy way to reduce your food's weight and volume, so there's really no reason not to. While you're doing this, you can combine any ingredients that you wanna combine so that you can make things easier for yourself while you're out hiking. Now for the next layer of packaging, unless there's a law that says that I have to keep my food in a bear resistant container, I always keep my food in a simple waterproof sack. A waterproof sack will keep in leaks, it'll keep out moisture, and most importantly, it'll reduce the smell of your food. It can also be hung from a tree if needed. If you're on a really tight budget, be it a financial budget or a time budget, you can make a cheap and relatively durable food bag using just a contractor bag and some tape. Once you've grasped the basic concepts of provisioning, you should now work on simplifying your provisions and your process of provisioning as much as possible. Simplification is the ultimate goal of every aspect of our backcountry logistics. Simplifying your provisions means reducing packaging, reducing your preparation, reducing the complexity for provisions, you know, just simplifying things as much as possible so that your process of provisioning could be as easy to repeat as possible and your provisions will be as easy to eat and easy to manage as possible and you'll be able to get the most from your provisions as you can from the smallest amount of energy input. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you head over to my website and check out my other content.